already can make a projection of exactly what that's gonna cost me and really establish the way that I'm gonna run my operation for this calendar year. So, so when everybody else wants to own cows, we're okay selling some cows. Um, and when it doesn't look that shiny, we're okay getting the herd kind of ramped up. We, we've had to learn how to really analyze an opportunity because uh, sometimes opportunities can turn into distractions mm -hmm. where you end up doing about 50,000 different things thinking you're getting way ahead, right? And you're like, oh, that good. What if I pick two things that I could be really good at? Welcome back to the Wealthy Cowboy Show. I'm your host, Crockett Carruthers. And today we have the guys from 100th Meridian Ranching, uh, Justin Rader and Lane Hill. And we're going to dive into how they got started in that aspect, how they started that company, that business, the ranch up, and then what they're doing and, and how they've got creative and as far as a business standpoint and making it work. So how's it going, guys? It's good. Yeah. It's good. I'm just happy to be here, Crockett. Yeah. Y'all have uh y'all traveled a little ways down here, huh? Yeah, and the kids were good and uh we only had to stop like twice, so we're and good. Y'all are based mainly around Canadian, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Just uh a little bit scattered out more than we'd like, but yeah. Call Canadian home. Right. Cool. You gotta and especially like y'all are y'all are leasing a lot of country, so you gotta just kinda take it as it comes. As long as you can pencil it out. Yes, we keep the pickups hot, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> but, but we're glad to be able to have the chance. Yeah. Um, I want to get into y'all's backgrounds because I know you you got a lot of education. Y'all both grew up ranching. Um, you got a lot of education um, in ranching and, and kind of different ways of doing things. So if you can start out kind of like, how'd you grow up? the family the family operation and then where'd you take it from there yeah you bet um so my wife and i bryn we real similar stories both ranch kids in the texas panhandle moms were teachers dads were ranchers both dads were cow calf and stalkers um but a lot different places and and uh ways of looking at ranching and 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 so that was interesting so she's a nurse practitioner um, went to West Texas and then at Vanderbilt to get her nurse practitioner stuff. And so she takes care of that, that, uh, she's good at taking care of people. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I kind of developed the idea eventually that ag was the only way I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. So, um, went to Oklahoma state, studied range land management, went to TCU, um, studied the ranch management program for a year, came back for a while and then got married and then after that we were able to go to ranching for profit um of course and and that changed our life too again so um that's just kind of the the highlights of education but really now learning from people who are just doing all kinds of stuff well mm -hmm. i think is so important so um, yeah I, so those those degrees and certifications and stuff that you got from those those places i would assume gave you a really good head start into kind of how to run a place and kind of what you're wanting to do and then still being able to learn from the lessons you're learning on your own operation then look at other people's operations that's seems like the way to go yeah yeah that was really good growing up you think like this is the way everybody does it but you see other stuff and you learn things from other people and and each of those steps was a good step at the time you know like when you're 18 year old kid you need one thing but when you're a 30 year old you know 40 year old that's been wrestling with stuff in real life you need another thing kind of mm -hmm. too so all those steps have been good for the stage of life we were in at the yeah. time uh lane what about you what, what's your job title at the ranch uh so here at 100th meridian ranching i serve as the bull lease manager um essentially uh in the bull lease division i cover everything from booking logistics um health um keeping culling um, vet checks, uh, marketing, uh, and then I also fill in on the stalkers and the cow calf side of things uh, during the fun times or yeah. the busy seasons, you know. And where you you came from, not the Panhandle. Right? No, no, I actually grew up in Ozona, Texas, um, down southwest of San Angelo. I I tell people eighty miles from Walmart, eighty miles from Mexico. Um, grew up in a like a ranch based family. 
Um, I'd be the fourth one, uh, fourth generation here that's um, that's worked with animals and land uh, for a living. Um, my granddad ranched full time for himself. Eventually, you know, he started out with nothing and worked for some folks, and and then ended up starting up on his own. And when I was a kid, my dad um, managed a ranch for like fifteen years, something like that, and. Um, it got to the point where uh, either we're going to do this on our own and take out a whole lot of um, debt and risk or we're going to get a job in town. And uh, just because of the safety and the stability of that, benefits, um, you know, a guy with a young family, we thought that was the best way to go. So we we did that. My mom taught school and and uh, we shot a lot of horses <laughs> and uh, rode colts and trained dogs and and stuff like that um but you know since uh, i went to south plains and tech and um kind of chased the stock show deal for a little while and uh kind of found my way back to where we're at now and uh you know it, it's a pretty neat a pretty neat path but uh i tried the town deal and it's not for me yeah <laughs> um so we're uh, we're back where we're at and and really um my wife courtney and our daughters are really grateful um, Justin's been great to work for, um, you know, him and, him and Brent own, own 100th Meridian, but, uh, I don't, I don't feel, there's not a day that I feel like I have a boss, you know, he's created a culture that, that really feels like a partnership mm -hmm. more than anything. And that's been, that's been really beneficial. I think it, it keeps our operation going forward. You know, we never spend a stagnant day. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the highlights. I'm pretty good at making a short story long. <laughs> well, I, you touch on something that I think is super important is I've heard it now, now that I'm researching and trying to grow and reading books and all this stuff that, and then looking back at, I mean, I learned it in real life, but most people will, will go and stay where the opportunity is not necessarily the, the monetary compensation. Yeah. So if you go somewhere and it starts out at low pay, but you can work your way up and eventually get to the better pay and then also take ownership in the company and, and, and climb the ladder and get more responsibilities, you're going to attract better employees, mm -hmm. uh, better partners, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in my own life, I mean, that's definitely the path it seems like I, I've gone – you know, you go somewhere and you're just working for the pay and there's you feel like there's nowhere to go. You're going to be looking for somewhere else to go at some point. You're going to leave. But if you can if you can give somebody an opportunity to grow with the company, with the operation, whatever it is, then you're going to keep those A players there longer and, you know, for life. Yes, for sure. And and I don't want to forget the people at home, too, because that's mm -hmm. our team. So there's Bryn and I as, as a couple. But the uh, guy who couldn't make it today, Dusty, so he's he's the guy who gets stuff done while me and Lane are getting distracted on side projects mm -hmm. a lot of times. So it's at different times we had things out of balance when, when I was kind of like a one man show, you know, I'm balancing cattle, economics, family time, and and you know all these things, and I get a lot of stuff out of balance. But I feel like now. With us as a team, we can fill in for for each other better. Mm -hmm. um, that makes a more balanced, well-rounded kind of business and lives for our families too. Because we all have kids, we want to teach them that like ranching is fun. It's not just seven days of work. We you know seven days a, a week work, and then it's, that it's like beneficial. And so we want to teach them that too. So it's important for us to try to stay as balanced as we can mm -hmm. with the personal stuff too. Um, but it wouldn't be possible without Lane and Dusty and Brand yeah, and I helping think balance that. The, the way that I think now, it's like I would rather work shorthanded and harder, you know, and not be afraid to go fill in. Like, hey, you're you're going to be out, you know. I'll have to work twice as hard for a few days or a week or whatever it is. I'll, I'll yeah, whatever. But I know that if I need to go step away, you, you'd do the same for me. And instead of instead of work having ten guys around that are just warm bodies, you know, I would rather work around a short crew and work harder. But it's a better environment. Everybody's if everybody's happy and and uh, you know glad to be there and and wanting to help out. Yes, definitely. We don't want it to be a salt mine, mm -hmm. but we got to be economically sound too, and and stay stay 
efficient and, and productive. Mm -hmm. um, so balancing all that. Yeah. How did so? You went to you went to Oklahoma State. You went to TCU. Ranch for profit. When did you start Hundredth uh, Meridian Ranching in that era? Yeah. So um, after college, I came home um, and worked with my my dad and family for about eight years. Um, and part of that, we got married. So um, Bryn comes and learns about you know what we're what's what's going on. And um, but even as a kid, I'd always kind of had the idea of like. It's my job to to sort to start to wean myself off the ranch salary, kind of. And it was always our dream to to work towards our own stuff. And and once Ben and I had time to develop that fully, you know, talking over, you know, um, just dreaming a little bit better, we we kept you know kept working for the family for a couple of years. But we felt like, and in the meantime, we were able to piece together some leases and and keep working on you know cow herd and some stalker deals and stuff. Um, so we were fortunate to be able to do that, and we still had a good ranch job. But it, but stepping towards the dream was kind of a goal, and and you're kind of herky jerky, you know. Some days you're really ready to do it, and some days you're not. I'm not so sure I can do it. Um, but so that that developed, and that stepping towards that dream was awesome for us. And a big part of that was going to ranching for profit. We felt like we came out of that. We realized what we what we had in front of us and what we could do with it. And that helped us say, hey, we're going to commit, kind of burn the ships. You know, you hear the stories of the, of the, you know, the sailors who come and they want the crew to be on board. So they burn the ship so mm -hmm. they don't have a way out. Uh, we kind of burned the ship and, and just committed. And so that was beneficial um, just to have that goal. Like, we're going to commit. We're going to do this and, and, and finally start. So Ranching for Profit was a big help to us to kind of give us the confidence to get 100% get, uh, committed. And so when you you had you had a little bit of country built up and stuff, where did where did you come up with the idea? I mean, bull leasing's not new, and these other things that you're doing is not a new idea. But y'all kind of changed it up and got creative about how you were going to make it a profitable business instead of just getting these places and turning some mama cows out. Yes, yes. And so, kind of back up like the the purpose of why we wanted to exist and be as a business and a families was a big part of it is to encourage people in agriculture, especially young people, because we all need encouragement. We all have crummy days. We've had a lot of crummy days and people came and encouraged us. So a big part of that was to say thank you to them and to help pay some of that back to people who, because we all need encouragement. Mm -hmm. And then kind of another reason was to, you know, there's different phases of ranch business across the United States. And, there's a lot of old generational kind of sort of stuck ranches that exist and they're, you know, they have, you know, pretty big holdings, but they're not innovating as fast as they maybe could. Mm -hmm. We were a baby ranch at the time. And so a big part of that was to develop a model where we proved out that, that young ranches can be profitable and balanced and strong and secure and do that in a way that like helped, breathe life back into small towns. Cause that's one of our passions kind of is like you drive through any of these small towns on the way from here to Canadian today, a lot of them are shriveling up and mm -hmm. I, I hate that. So part of why we exist is to bring great young families back into agriculture and, and have it work for an economic model and a social model that breathes life back into small towns. And so that's kind of why we started doing it. But, and we wanted to do it in a way that was like, biblically stewardship sound um and for the like that stewardship part for like economics uh ecology and the people part of it i think if we stay pretty balanced on those things we got a really good chance of being pretty successful for the long haul mm -hmm. when we get out of whack it gets fragile for sure we can make all the money but in the world but break our back or not enjoy it doing it and it's not gonna last long mm -hmm. um so so we kind of set that as the goal. Like if we can have it be fun and profitable, beneficial, we want to do it. And we tried some things that were, you know, a, you know, say calving out heifers or whatever. It's okay, but it's not, it doesn't check all the boxes as well as we wanted it to. So we've tried different enterprises, but the bulls, the lane's been able to help us so much on, that kind of comes and it checks all those boxes. Um, 
And so that's been fun to develop. It's, mm -hmm. And the funnest thing is, you know, we're here to help people. If our business isn't helping somebody do better in the rest of their business in life, we're failing. So when we were just producing a calf and selling it at the sale barn, we don't even know who our customer is, which is a problem. And you, your pay kind of comes in proportion to that, mm -hmm. to the size of the problem you're solving. So when we're helping somebody minimize the need or hassle with bulls, we know that person. They text us. We call them. We see their ranch. They see our place. We're, you know, if they got a crippled bull, we just give them a backup. Those kind of things I feel like are truly helping people and solving problems for them. Mm -hmm. So that that checks more boxes than just making a product, yeah, or a commodity, I guess I should say. Yeah, you're able, you're able to help other people, and they're helping you grow your operation too. And it's a, that's, you know, it's it's got to be beneficial. That's business got to be beneficial to both parties. And uh, just like you said, you know, the bigger the problem that you solve for somebody, the more you're going to get paid. So if you if you have a very disconnected problem of Taking a calf to the sale barn, that's a long way from being in the grocery store. You're going to be a long ways from getting paid. So, yeah, that, that was great thinking. That, so where, where did you learn these concepts? Like, did you learn this going to school in the Rancher for Profit School is what really set it off? Or were you studying studying stuff, business stuff on the side? or Yeah, a combination of everything. You know, like the culture, regular colleges in America are a decent foundation, but I'm kind of embarrassed they let me graduate without knowing some important stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so some of that, and but TCU was a wonderful eye opener, you know, the program and seeing other ranches and they're open with their challenges and successes and, and their books and their, and their, you know, physical ranches, seeing a lot of that opens your eyes. And then, um, learning from neighbors and learn from, you know, or other people we work with or for, um, but you know, podcast and ranching for profit kind of like, you know, after being in the real world for for a while, out of, you know, eight or ten years, you wrestle with some things in that time of kind of like, where am I in life? Mm -hmm. Where's the business in life? And that tied a bunch of that together and help, helped explain it in a way where it made sense and it clicked and we could, we could segment one problem and start working on it. And then we move to the next problem and work on it. Because ranching is so complex. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's hard to know where to start. Yeah. I mean, I think you got in, in, any, in anything, I'm huge on mentorship and, and learning and stuff, but at some point you got to get out there and do it. And like you said, you want to have the context. You can't get coached without the context first. Like I went out there and did this and now you go ask somebody, how can I make it better? Or how can I correct? It didn't work. How can I correct and fix this problem? But if you never go do it, if you just went to the schools first, you're gonna have no context. So you're going to go out there with a book and who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> exactly. Especially, like you said, you're dealing with animals and mother nature. Those are very unpredictable. Besides, uh, most of the time it's going to be, we're going to be in a drought, it seems like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and one of your biggest things is the bull leasing, which is is Lane's division. So if you would kind of go over, go over that part. The Silver Philly is a family-run boutique that carries both women's clothes and Eli's shirts for men. You may remember Mike Morrow from episode 12. The Silver Philly is ran by his daughter and the whole family is involved. So if you want to do business with a super nice ranching family, check out the Silver Philly Boutique and they are processing payments with us at Diversified Payments. Uh, I'll kind of walk you through just the steps. Uh, so say Crockett, you call... Um, you say, hey, uh, I've got a uh, hundred cows. I need I need some bulls to breed them. I'm like, all right, we recommend one to twenty five. Um, we offer three different breeds, right? So um, black Angus, red Angus, and Charlays. Um, most of the Charlays, most of the reds are all kind of one type and kind within their respective breeds. Uh, and then when we break into the black cattle, um, we've got three different types of black Angus bulls. So we've got our growier kind, kind of our shorter. Um, stockier, like low input type kind. Uh, and then we've got uh, more of our maternal type kind, if you will, just soggy, soft, flexible, that kind of thing. Um, and we price things off of two different seasons. So your peak season and your off season. Uh, peak season would range from April 1st through July 31st. And the off season will be the remainder calendar year. Um, 
peak season right now, pricing is at fourteen hundred uh, per bull. Uh, off season is at a thousand uh, with a two bull minimum, uh, and that's mainly just animal care and handling, especially traveling, uh, just as much for the customer as it is for us. Because uh, the last thing, uh, there's two really, really detrimental things that could happen to our operation, and one of them is getting a customer hurt. <laughs> uh, that that news travels really fast. Yeah. So uh, we need to we need to make sure we're protected there. Number as well. one rule: don't kill the customer. That's that. That's one of that's that's <laughs> that's that's one point a. You know, um, our our deal is: hey, I will bring you a semen checked, trick tested bull that is sound and in working shape. If you will return a trick tested bull, um, we cover freight one way, and uh, you're responsible just for getting them back. Um, as far as uh, the range that we cover, I mean, we've got stuff anywhere from southern Montana to um, all the way dang near Brownsville. Um, as far east as Missouri, and as far west as uh, western New Mexico and Colorado, and and that's all different kinds of seasons. I was in I was in New Mexico. A week or two ago, up in kind of the high desert, rough country, and it's dry out there. Uh, and I get a text message: a, a guy uh, was swimming some bulls across a, a drainage ditch just to get in his pasture after the hurricane uh, down in Hempstead. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a little different, <laughs> a little different uh, type of environment for those cattle. So, um, yeah. And, and how do you select? bulls how do you keep bulls that can go to those different environments man how tough is that that's a great question that's probably the hardest part of my job to be (laughs) honest with you um we gotta be pretty tough on them to be honest with you um and i think that's one thing that um one of the challenges that that i face personally is probably a stereotype right uh where maybe i get viewed as kind of a used car salesman (laughs) Um, well, I'm not going to lease a, one of them sorry old lease bulls. You know, those things ain't no good. I'm like, well, okay. Um, I tell you, if you uh, if you want me to unload a, a bull that's been sitting in a feedlot or just come out of the sale pen and, you know, he's got eight tenths of back fat on him and, hey, you probably don't need to call me. Um, we keep those cattle um, in working shape. Uh, they go out. They, they walk with their heads down eating grass. Um, we're very, very critical of those cattle as far as docility goes, uh, as far as fleshing ability goes, um, as far as fertility goes. Um, so just just being able to do a job. Um, another thing when we're acquiring bulls, we buy bulls uh, and we also raise some bulls. Uh, and something that's really helped is we've been able to buy, uh, as we've grown, um, business gets easier when it's to scale, right? So we've been able to gather up bulls in larger quantities um, so say, hey, I'm kind of interested in your deal. Let's see what happens. And like, let me have, you know, half a dozen or a dozen of them. We'll try them for till they're two year olds. Probably we'll send them out as yearlings, see how they hold up. Uh, and by the time they get to be full two year olds, we'll know if that's a route we want to go down. Just as far as those cattle's doability uh, and sustainability within our operation. Mm-hmm. And why, why would somebody want to lease a bull rather than buy? Well, I think. So Justin's Justin's like a spreadsheet nerd, right? Um, I listen to the high points, um, but my attention span is pretty short. Um, but I think, like, if you just look at the numbers, so um, study in December 2023 says that average Angus bull price uh, in America is just a hair over seven thousand. Um, I think you figure in that number. Let's say let's he's got a lifespan of four and a half years. We're going to figure in depreciation, feed, hay, vet bills, um, cripples, uh, sterility, um, and then we cull them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you factor all that out, I mean, you're going to be minimum 2000 per year that you own that bull. So what's what it's going to cost to keep him? Well, I mean, at least them for 1400 you know, so you're, you're saving hundreds of dollars right off the bat, which opens up a whole new level of possibilities as far as your business goes. Um, when we look at, um, let me think here, I want to figure out how to explain this. Um, when we look at just pulling bulls out of our operation, we can increase our cow herd by 5%, no matter how big your cow herd is, right? In today's market, I mean, five might not be a big number, but when you put a percent behind it and take them to the sale barn, that's adding up right now. 
Um, I think outside of that, freeing up that cash flow is huge, right? Especially for for guys that are younger, starting out, or really any size. Um, you know, so say you've got 250 cows, you need 10 bulls. You're not going to replace them all at once. But say you need three of them, right? So let's go buy three of them. That's anywhere from probably fifteen to 25000 okay? Um, or we can lease them for a fraction of the cost. Uh, when we're figuring figuring in our cost of operation, anticipating our cash flow throughout the year, I already can make a projection of exactly what that's going to cost me and really establish the way that I'm going to run my operation for this calendar year versus going to the sale or going to somebody's house and letting emotions take over. And, uh, you know, the worst, I'm the worst at sales. Like, it, it doesn't matter if it's cattle sales or, or horse sales or whatever. Like, ah, I bet I can hit him one more time. And then, man, we're we're like 2,500 <laughs> past where we thought we were going to cut off, mm-hmm. you know. So I think uh, I think uh, just looking at, at cash flow and yearly savings, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to make this into a sales pitch at all. Um, I think when you... Uh, it's just like anything, you know, I think we give old timers a hard time, right? Like, all oh, these guys don't want to change. They've been doing it. Well, man, there's probably a reason those guys are a little hesitant to change, right? They've seen it go south. Uh, and that's the best way you learn a lesson is when it don't go good. Uh, so I'm not the guy that says, hey, get rid of your bulls, you know. Um, we've got guys that, I mean, they run a 1,000 cows. They need 40 bulls, and they lease 10 or 15, you know, Um you know, if you've got 100 cows, you need four bulls. And at least you one or two and see how it goes. You know, that's mm-hmm. maybe phase your own out throughout the years. Yeah, and test it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I, to be honest with you, I don't think it's, I don't think you should quit anything cold turkey and just dive head first. Um, I wouldn't do it at least. Um, you know, really, to me, Crockett, the, the numbers, I think, speak for themselves. If you're, if you're conscious about making a profit, and truly being economical, um, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, but outside of that, my 10,000-foot view is when you call me and you say, hey, Lane, I need, you know, I need four bulls on May 1st. Um, I'm like, all right, I got you booked. And you know those cattle are going to show up. You're going to have four bulls. They're going to be sound. They're going to be in breeding shape. They're not going to go backwards. They're going to be fertile, and they're going to have a clean trick test. And then if something happens while you have them, I got it covered. I'll replace him free of charge within the first 60 days of a lease. And after 90 days, they're gone. You don't have to worry about them the rest of the year. You don't have to worry about them being ready to do their job when you turn them out. And then you don't have to worry about them breaking themselves and your stuff all the other list of things that can happen. Yeah, and I think one thing you didn't touch on was the opportunity cost of that. Absolutely. 7,000. You know, you go buy a small operation, you buy three bulls. I mean, in 7,000 is a, a really good bull. You could buy cheaper, but to say it's 15,000, yep. you could go put that 15,000 back into your ranch or pay yourself or what, you know, whatever the whatever it is, but you're if you buy those bulls, I mean, that money's tied up whereas if you don't tie that money up, you could use that money to invest somewhere else and then pay for the lease. So you said, you said pay yourself. Is that something we're supposed to do in ag? <laughs> it's supposed uh, to be in there somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. I thought we were just supposed to work for free. <laughs> uh, but no, opportunity interest, absolutely. And, and I'm sorry I skipped over that. Um, that's something that's actually, um, Justin's like the king of interest uh, when it comes to running numbers and looking at our different enterprises, whether it be stockers or cows and and uh, those numbers look really good until you figure an opportunity interest, and you're like, wait a second, we might be doing something a little different with this capital. But yeah, and you, and then also, like you said, I've worked at places that go buy the high dollar bulls from the registered operations that cost, you know, five, six, seven thousand, or whatever, and and up. And you go buy a handful of those good young bulls, and then you get them up the next time, and you got one with the broke dick or one with the broke leg or something, and that stuff's just gonna happen. Yeah, you're like. What do we do with these? Yeah. Like, yeah, he's no good anymore. You're gonna have to sell him, and you're gonna go get a couple thousand at the sale barn form or at the packer, and you just lost all that money. And then you also have to go replace them again. Yeah, and it's like these guys are like, 
are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> like it, it happens. So you, you take a little risk out yeah. and, and put it on y'all. And, uh, like I said, the opportunity cost, you're, you're eliminating some risks there. So I think it's a really good problem that y'all have solved here. Yeah. And, and that's, there's been a learning curve. I mean, I learn every single day just as far as, you know, in business, like the biggest opportunities come when you find something that nobody else wants to do, right? Or isn't able to do. Um, and, and we're probably not in this business because we just love dealing with the bulls all the time. <laughs> I don't mind it because it's really all I do. So, you know, I'm just dealing with the devil that I know. Um, but I think we're able to, if we had 10 bulls, we'd have just as much trouble as we do with, you know, three or four or 500. Um, when it comes down to figuring out just, just the little tricks to handling those things, repopulating them, how we need to graze them, um, just figuring out how to manage those things at a big scale makes it way easier for us to carry that burden than it does for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because y'all are a specialist. And, I mean, just like anything, like I, I always bring up the, the little old rancher that, you know, has a little bumper pull trailer and a handful of cows. Well, that bumper pull trailer only goes to town a couple times a year. So probably every time that you load some calves on it to take to town, you're going to have blowouts because the tires are dry routed from sitting there. So it's like, don't even have that trailer yeah. and just call the sale barn or call yeah. somebody to come haul them, you know, and you're going to save yourself a lot of headache. hundred yeah. percent. Which is, some people like to do it for a hobby and that's a different deal. But as far as if you're looking at your time and, and as a business standpoint, probably better just to hire somebody else to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you brought up something earlier on, on high dollar bulls and, and I don't want to discredit those operations. I've been to some awesome places and seen some, phenomenal cattle and and i dang sure don't want to downplay genetics right we've got some purebred cattle we've got commercial bulls um both uh the commercial bulls we do like an hd 50k test on those things just to know the genomics and the percentile rankings behind those cattle just so we know how to identify outliers whether it be birth weight and calving ease or a little extra growth or whatever um but i think at 2024 and this is just my belief and there's people been out there doing it a lot longer than i have I do not think that genetics are a limiting factor. I think that our ability to optimize animal performance and rangeland improvement through grass is where we're going to make our money Mm -hmm. way more than just improved genetics. That's just me, though. Yeah, I mean, there are still some bad genetics out there. But but any bigger operation and and actual somebody trying to do it as a business, you're probably not going to be dealing with that. Of course, we get called sometimes to go catch some inbred stuff that's been turned out for years, and you're going to have some ugly-looking things that are never going to be much. But, yeah, uh, yeah I would say most people are – even even uh, even my cows, my little operation, I put horn cows out, uh-huh. longhorns and coriennes, and put a good Charlie bull back on them. And, I mean, that yep. even increases their genetics. So, yep. uh, yeah, you can – and especially – with y'all's deal, even if you got some just throw together cows or whatever, you go get a good bull. I mean, it's really going to increase your calf crop. And I, like you said, yeah, these days, I mean, we're kind of we're always calling, especially after the these past few years, as many cattle as we've killed. You know, anything that's not very good, hopefully, is mm-hmm. a lot of it's gone mm-hmm. out of the out of mm-hmm. the system now. Um, but bull leasing is one of y'all's biggest things. But you've tried other things, and y'all still do a lot of other things. What are some of those? What are, what are some some of the things you've tried and, and what have you stuck with? Yeah, um, it's more or less the things we've tried are in, within the cattle business. You know, um, we pretty consistently turn some heifer calves into bred cows, uh, so that means calving them out, dealing with all the problems that come with that, and then being able to market a pair or a bred cow that's not a heifer mm-hmm. that people are, are don't want to mess with a lot. That stays pretty consistent. Um, one thing that's been rewarding is is custom grazing for people. Um, so we custom graze for a really wonderful ranch family. Um, they just send us good cows. They're great to deal with, and they become friends and family practically. Um, it's just providing a service for a home for them, for the, a way to for them to increase their ranch, you know, scale. Um, same on a stalker deal. Um, we graze some seasonal stalkers. Um, some of our leases are dictated to us like seasonally, and. Um, and so around home, where we're able to, 
we sell gray stuff. So we'll, we'll be pretty intensive on our management with lots of paddocks and lots of moves. Some of our farther away leases are like a seasonal lease where it really works better for stalkers. So we'll, we'll own some stalkers or we'll custom graze some stalkers on that. Um, and then owning some cows, you know, we kind of play the, the 10 year cattle cycle a little bit, buy them when they're ugly and cheap. And then, you know, um, and then when everybody wants a cow, when you hear about one thing I learned the last cattle cycle, you know, from 2014, when you hear how high cows are in a sermon at church, you should probably go sell your cows because <laughs> they're about to do what cows did from 14 to 16, which is plummet. Yeah. So, so when everybody else wants to own cows, we're okay selling some cows. Um, and when it doesn't look that shiny, we're okay getting the herd kind of ramped up and ride that, you know, that five year low up to the 10 year, you know, that we kind of play that cow cycle thing some. So, um, yeah, I never understood that. Warren Buffett says, you know, he's, he's playing the stock market and stuff, but he always says, you know, walk when everybody else is running and run when everybody else is walking. And it, it's funny to see every spring when there's a little bit of rain and green grass, you know, everybody wants a cow. Or when, like now, when cattle are really high and interest is really high, everybody wants a cow. Yeah. And if you can just, like you said, sell out and then just sit there and wait, which it's hard to sit on your hands and have country out there not getting grazed. You think you're not doing any good, but if you can, if you can hold out and then it's going to come back to where they're giving those things away. Yes. Yeah. So, so in all that kind of plays into like what capital we have to, to use and, and it changes at times, you know, and, and hopefully we're, we're slowly ramping up, but you know, for a lot of people, custom grazing is an overlooked thing. I feel mm -hmm. like um, as long as they're providing a good service and their customers happy, it's a pretty good way to get, get a start ranching. So I'd encourage a lot of people to think about that. I had never thought about it till I'm 30 years old. You know, that's kind of embarrassing how, how limited my scope of imagination yeah. was on ways to make money. And we're really, you know, just use sunshine salesman upgrade and sunshine to grass to beef or a service. And, and we gotta we gotta keep the main thing the main thing for sure. Yeah, I mean, if you can go find the find the grass, then you can put your own on it, or like you said, sell to somebody else. Just be the middleman and get paid, and you don't have any risk there. Um, it's the same thing as a few episodes ago. We we had a guy that that was a wholesale real estate guy. If you go find the deal, you're gonna be able to monetize it. Whether you're just the middleman or you're able to fix it up and, and, and do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I would say that's the biggest thing and that's, that's hard. How have you been able to, to find those leases and find those, that grass? I, I wish I could tell you, I, some of them are just, you know, luck or the grace of God. And, and they, the people come to you, mm -hmm. they say like a neighbor came to us this year and said, Hey, would you like to lease this place? And we said, we'd love to, um, some of them, I feel like we have drug our guts out all over the Texas Panhandle trying to get these ranch leases, and we are about zero percent success. <laughs> um, so I don't have an explanation for it, but but one thing that does relate to it is it's all relationships, mm -hmm. and and we lease from seven or eight different landlords, and fingers crossed, knock on wood, they're all happy, and we've never lost a lease. Um, but they become like family if we if and everybody has different levels of involvement with their property. So, you know, a landowner, some of them have never seen the place that they lease to us. Some of them live on the place, and we see them every time we're in there checking cows. Um, so there's different levels of engagement with how they want their property to be for them. Mm -hmm. um, but really th talking to them, communicating. We do rangeland transects and photos. I'm a range nerd. Um, and we re relay that in our grazing chart and our rainfall and, and things like a quail hatch or oil field traffic um, and fence condition, what we're doing and when. We try to relay that to all of our landowners as much as they want it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like that's been part of the, of, of the good relationships that have developed is just communication yeah, and, and taking care of their place. I'm proud of... You know, we love all of our neighbors and we want to encourage them, but I'm proud that over time through our grazing, we start to see the fence line differences happen where more diverse, healthier, bigger, robust grasses are coming on this side of the fence. And, and it's it's really encouraging to 
to see the rangeland resource improve. And hopefully that is a generational thing that keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. Rather than we can all overstock a place and hammer it, and, and that's not going to do anybody good for long. Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully it's just taking care of their place, um, keeping it up. That's important to people. They want to, They don't want to see trash out there, so we pick up trash. We we clean up stuff and um, just relating to them what's going on, what we're seeing, and just being honest about good things and problems that, that come up. Mm-hmm. I think, like you said, relationships are a big part of it. And I want to talk about that on the other side, besides getting the leases through those relationships, but keeping customer relationships and the marketing and sales aspect and and the more business side, which you're going to have through your whole operation, but a lot in the bull leasing, um, uh, whichever one of y'all wants to speak on that a little bit. Yeah, I can start, and then Justin can probably – um, fill in the gaps. Um, that's what I do a lot of right now. And, um, my wife, my wife told me yesterday, she's like, man, I've been having a lot of problems. Like you've been having a lot of problems with bulls out right now. Like, right. And, uh, it's like, well, the only ones we ever hear about are the ones that are like not doing real good. Right. Uh, and, and honestly, um, I can think of like five bulls since April that we've had a issue with right um but being willing or being willing and ready to act on an issue i think uh because that say that bull goes down that cow's heat cycle is not going to hold until i can get another one there in 10 days so i think being able to fix a problem instantly really adds a lot of value i think being flexible and transparent just as far as you know hey this is what i got sorted out for you um, send them a video or whatever. Um, describe the cattle and and really try to accurately represent the cattle and and make an honest transaction. I think is what we really try to pride ourselves on. And um, because I, I don't uh, undersell and over deliver kind of deal. Yeah. You know, I want to make sure that you're happy because if you're not happy, you ain't coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know something that I really I really enjoy and I'm. Now that we're kind of slowed up, it's not as busy anymore. I'm getting to travel a lot more and see, you know, I mentioned going out to New Mexico. Something that uh, really helps me is, is to see your ranch, see your operation, see how you're running them, see the environment that these cattle are running in. Uh, that helps me, like we talked about, selection and and how are we weeding out the bad ones. That helps me a lot. We're going to go down to College Station tomorrow, and, uh, you know, that's a whole different neck of the woods. So, just being willing to go out of the way and and talk to people and have a relationship and people love to talk about themselves if mm-hmm. you just let them, you know, and that's fine uh, because like Justin talked about earlier, you know, education's great. I got an education too, um, but man, I probably learned more from just talking to guys that have been out there and done it. Mm-hmm. Um, that goes a little bit further than the textbook will. Yeah, being able to ask questions and find out their specific situation and how you can how you can help them or not help them you know um in my sales you know in my credit card process and sales you know i've i do turn people away sometimes i always want to get as many clients as possible but i'm like hey maybe we're not the right fit for you but um keep us in mind in the future or whatever you know turn people away and actually listen to their problems and if you can help them or not you know i think that's i think that speaks volumes um I think you'd rather have the reputation of of being a, a good person and servicing the customers that are a good fit for your operation and knowing what fits and what doesn't mm-hmm. instantly really saves you a lot of bad experiences, right? Uh, because you don't you don't want to be known as Crockett Crothers, you know, the credit card guy. You want to be known as that Crockett Crothers is a good guy. He's a cowboy. He knows a little bit about technology, and he makes sure I get paid fast. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's the guy you want to be, not the not the credit card guy. Yeah, you know how how about the marketing side of things? How are y'all besides word of mouth? How are y'all going out and finding new customers? Especially like you said, I mean, all over the country, really. So a lot of that's networking, right? So if we can ensure on our end, people have a really positive experience. They tell their friends. They tell your friends, right? Word of mouth. Um, outside of that, we'll do some trade shows. Um, that's a really neat deal. Um, just getting to hear from people and answer questions. And I think the more questions we have to answer, 
the better in touch we are with our operation, right? It's like, man, I hadn't thought about that. We need to do that better. Yeah. Um, kind of some self-discovery that's very unexpected. Um, we've recently launched uh, our Facebook and Instagram. Uh, that's up and going. Um, Justin did a great job, and he can expand probably a little bit more on this than I can, just as far as he's developed a, a really, really neat uh, customer base organically. Um, just through networks, uh, as far as like Rancher for Profit or the TCU programs or Oklahoma State. Uh, and then just growing up, you know, kind of where I did was a little bit more of an untapped region uh, that they hadn't really dove into yet, um, which has been uh, been neat to to reconnect with a lot of folks, you know, you grow up with. So I'd, I'd say networking. Uh, and right now, the social media deal is doing good. Um, we've had fun uh, playing with that and doing some photo shoots and stuff like that. Justin puts on pretty good uh, clown makeup for those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. How speak on that about the relationships as far as getting your business going? Um, I think I went to Tarleton and I don't know how much I learned in the classroom, but I definitely have a lot of relationships that have helped me throughout my life. How has that been on in your business? Yes, for sure. And, and, you know, when we first started, I was making a crummy homemade flyer and sticking on the ice machine at Dairy Queen. So everything we've made is a step up because other people have helped helped us, you know, learn how to do it better. Um, but it is it is people and relationships ultimately, and and you know a lot of that networking helps. Um, and you just never like at a trade show you, when when a hundred people walk by. You don't know who is there. You, there's no telling who's going to walk up. Um, and so just that potential out there in the world and, and social and it's, it's awesome. The power of that networking relationship. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might have half of them are, are not ag people. You might have half of them that are and anywhere from one to, to 50 bull need. You don't know. You never know who's going to walk up. You never know who's out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you know, some people are, are last minute, they'll have a bull go down and, they just call. We they never come. We just send a bull, and and it's that kind of deal. Some people are close friends for years and years. Um, it's it's all you know varying degrees. Um, we wanted to make it where whoever we're helping has the ability to text us at any minute to help us to to let us know about a problem they've got. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing. Good thing that Lane had the other day. I think he had, you know, it was like. And I've got the numbers wrong. It was like three crippled bulls in three different states. So our deal is we're going to bring you back up. Bulls crippled, we bring you back up. But within probably two or three days, he had bam, bam, bam. Bulls are it that were already trick and semen test. That's part of the logistics is there's a the delay in that, you know, the results mm -hmm. come back on your trick test in, in the several days. But we, we hold we hold a reserve for things like that just because normal BS things happen with bulls. So we, we, we hold back about 10% roughly just to have that backup on in the bullpen ready to roll whenever somebody needs them. Because the last thing we want to do is have somebody miss some calves because we were we were messing around and weren't there fast enough. So um, I was, you know, the really good bull producers will give you a, a one-year guarantee, which is awesome. We're hoping we're giving you a, a every-year guarantee um, where you just, if it's a calf cop problem, it's it's – not due to lack of bulls. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a number of other things, but uh, a good using bull at the right time, hopefully is a problem that is solved. Right. It's just like credit card processing. Crockett, if that phone rings, you answer it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't think it's hard. It's not hard to answer the phone or reply to a text or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's just in my book, just being a good communicator and being a good businessman and being a good person, you know? Yeah. That's one of my big selling points is the, is the service that we offer you know it's your if i don't answer the phone you can text me i mean if i'm doing one of these i'll see it when i get out or something but i mean any time of day or night and then and that's not something you get from every corporation or in y'all's deal you know if you buy them at the cell barn you're pretty much done or at a bull sale or whatever it is um different ranches have different protocols but y'all being able to be on call and the way that you have the service set up every year you still have it going on so it's a pretty cool deal i want to put y'all on the hot seat a little bit where do you think this cattle market's going to go and 
how long do you think it's going to stay up here? Is it going to keep going or stay the same for a while? Or I'll let Lane go first so I can sound, <laughs> sound like I know what I'm talking about. I had the same idea. <laughs> uh, I tell you what, Crockett, if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> I'd be going to the cell barn right now, whether I was taking them or going to Vile, yeah. you know. Um, I will say that that listening to the so-called air uh, or uh, experts, you know, air quotes there, um, they're saying it's gonna hold on for another couple of years. Um, my general thoughts on it right now is those three, four, five-year-old cows are worth as much as they're ever gonna be worth right now. And by the time we depreciate them, I probably do like we was talking about earlier. Hey, we might think about rolling them things and maybe reinvesting in something that's maybe not prime mm -hmm. yeah my gut feel is like there's a whole lot more room underneath them than there is on top of them mm -hmm. but that's just kind of being roughed up in the 14 you know peak and crash and stuff so i think the one good thing is that people kind of remember that so i think people are kind of cautious but because of that we're probably drawing out the rebuilding a little bit probably put the cow cat people holding on to some good good profits here for the next couple of years at least yeah, and I think we talked about it in Wesley's episode, the uncontrollables of the of what happens in Chicago that has nothing to do with beef consumption or anything, you know, can really just crash the prices and, and or make them go up. You know, they usually go down a lot faster than they go up, but the uncontrollables, that's, that's a hard thing to deal with. Yeah, and it, that's another good thing. It's like it, it's important to ask the question, like say the cattle market dropped it, is this a problem or is this an opportunity? Mm -hmm. And that's one thing we've kind of like started kicking around as a team is, is is this a problem or is this an opportunity? And I think that's important for people to think about sometimes. Yeah, and I think most, you know, a lot of successful people that I follow and listen to and read about and everything, that's how they look at things. They look at a problem as an opportunity. If I have this problem, then somebody else probably has this problem. And if I can come up with a solution, they'll probably pay me to yeah. to solve it for them. So, yeah, yeah you, if you look at things as opportunities, I mean, it just just that one little mindset shift, the one perspective shift can can change your life, change your operation, whatever it is, change your business. Yes, sir. I think you look at that too, Craig. It's something that. Um, this is not ranch related at all, but something that my wife and I had to figure out because uh, we live in the world where the more you work, the better you are and all that. But we, we've had to learn how to really analyze an opportunity because uh, sometimes opportunities can turn into distractions mm -hmm. where you end up doing about 50,000 different things thinking you're getting way ahead, right? And you're like, oh, dadgum, what if I pick two things that I could be really good at? Then we'd be moving somewhere. Right. Uh Gary Keller has that book, The One Thing. Yes. And you hear of the result of these rich people or wealthy people, you know, diversifying their income streams mm -hmm. and having multiple income streams. But then if you don't do the research, you don't get the context that most of them made a lot of money in one thing first and perfected one thing and then started going and doing other things. And and more on that side, they're more in, as an investor instead of actually actively having to go learn a new skill and apply it 100 percent um what's the most important lesson you've learned in the ranching business most small businesses fail in the first five years of opening there's a few issues that cause businesses to close one is paying too much in overhead expenses two is not getting enough customer traffic and three is not converting enough of that traffic into sales. If you want to ensure success in your business, these issues must be addressed. Check out the link below and book a call with me to see how we can help keep your business open and thriving so you're not just another statistic. I think they all point towards we're going to get humbled one way or the other. Um, and being humble is important. Um, whether it's like working with your spouse and learning their ins and outs of things they love and don't love in the business or, or a relationship or or a drought or market or whatever the challenge is, being willing to be humble and not let it crater you is good. Um, like we had those, we had that fire this year, the Smokehouse Creek fire. We had a fire in 2017. 
if those things don't change our lives, we weren't a lot. We were we didn't have a pulse. Like we didn't have emotions or each one of those changed our lives in a totally humbling. It, cr- it kind of craters you in a way, but it it enriches your life in a different way that I can't really explain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so being prepared to be humble is a good thing to have on your radar in ranching. Yeah, I mean, you could relate that back the fire to what you're saying probably because those fires come through and and it's devastation at first. But then when the, the rain comes back, I mean, it comes back green and in better shape than it was. So. Like you said, so you go through those hard times and it cuts your legs out from under you and you're like, what the hell? But then you're going through you're going through the hard time to come out better on the other side of it. Yes, sir. I think I think for me, Crockett, it comes down to two things, work ethic and an attitude. When I say work ethic, I, I think it kind of relates back to what we've talked about is working hard is not good enough. You got to be working at the right thing Mm -hmm. to make it. And and I think that's important because we weren't taught that. We were just taught to work hard. We weren't taught to work smart, you know, growing up. And I think when I, when I refer to attitude, uh, one of the Burson boys, which one of them says like ranch hard and be happy. Mm -hmm. Right. I tell you what, um, that might've been said as a joke or whatever, but I take it pretty serious on those crummy days. Hey, we're going to ranch hard and we're going to be happy. And, uh, Kind of to Justin's point, if you get wrapped up in the negative, because there's a lot of variables in this this way of life, and um, if you just learn how to be happy and just take the good with the bad, uh, man, you gotta. It, it's a neat life, but you gotta make sure your head's on right, or else it can be pretty miserable. Yeah, the there's a book I read a while back, and I can't even remember the exact title. It's like the Warrior's Way or the something about the Warriors or something, but. Uh, a lesson I got out of it was two things you can control in life is your attitude and your effort. Yes. No matter the situation, whether it's bad, whether it's a fire or you're on top of the world, you know, you can always control those two things. And it comes just exactly what you said. Work hard. You can control that. You can't control a fire or mother Mm -hmm. nature. You can control working hard and you can control your attitude towards Mm -hmm. it, being happy. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's not near as much fun to be mad and unhappy. No, it's not. It's not very fun for the folks around you yeah. either. Allegedly. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what is y'all's favorite restaurant? Josephine Street. Uh, Where is that at? San Antonio. Yeah, super, super neat. Uh, old, historic top restaurant there. Mm-hmm. Um, went there three days in a row one time. Ate the same thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Bacon wrap. Uh, Pepper crusted fillet. Yeah, get in on it. Yeah, that's my that's my last meal. I'm gonna have to try that out. We usually go to like Mi Tierra down there. Mi Tierra's good. Yeah, it's actually the same kind of area. It's right there on the the outside, the outskirts of downtown area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's super. Mi Tierra's good too. Yeah, that's real Mexican food. Yeah, yeah. What about you? Um, it's a place I'd never go by myself, but my wife got us to take an anniversary trip to this place called uh, Blackberry Mountain, and they can make. You name the food, you name dirt, you know, grass, <laughs> or tree bark, whatever. They can make whatever food it is the most delicious thing you've ever tasted. Where is that at? It was in Tennessee, so uh, a cool place there. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, thank y'all for coming on. Where can they, where can they find out more about y'all? And if they want to lease bulls or or talk to you about custom grazing or something like that. How can they find you? Yeah, so. Um, Facebook, Instagram, 100thmeridianranching.com. Also is a good place to find us. Uh, and Justin and I's phone numbers are both listed there. Feel free to reach out. If it's custom grazing, call him. If you call him about bulls, he's going to tell you to call me. <laughs> so he really likes to throw me under the bus, especially when we're booked out. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming on. I, I love the the attitude that y'all, that y'all bring to it and the creativeness. I always like learning new ways to look at things um especially when it comes to ranching you know it's not land is so hard to come by anymore and money's hard to come by like you gotta you gotta get creative and and see what see work what works best you know not just go buy some cows at the sale barn and turn them out and make a few thousand a year on a calf crop so it's cool to hear y'all's story and uh, what y'all got going on and where you're headed 
Yeah, you bet. Well, thank you for doing what you're doing too, because your your efforts amplified thousands and thousands of times just to teach us new stuff. And thanks for digging up the people and and sharing what they're doing with us. We appreciate what you're doing a lot. Awesome. Yeah. No, for sure. I think it it uh, being as ADHD as I am, it's kind of hard to focus. But if I can turn on a podcast and listen to a Western podcast talking about ranching and talking about business. I can go get me an hour worth of office work done. <laughs> yeah. You know, kind of sets the tone. Yeah. Uh, so, no, we appreciate you making that. That's yeah. cool. Awesome. Thank you all for coming in. See you all next time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.